who are all the lonely people. Think of lonely people. Think of this lonely person. Dory, right? I mean, is Dory a basket case or what? She tried so hard. Just keep on swimming. Just keep on swimming. Lonely. Lonely. How about this character? Near and dear to my heart. I love this guy. I love this guy. But he was all alone, remember? Compacting trash eon after eon. The only company he had was a cockroach. How sad it is when you find refuge with a cockroach. How lonely is that? How about this guy? Is this guy lonely? Hugo. Left alone in a train station, trying to make his way in the world. One of my all-time favorite movies is based on a book. You may not know this one, but my guess is you had to read the book in English in high school, To Kill a Mockingbird. How many have read that? Have you read that book? Yeah. Do you know who this is? Boo Radley. Sad, sad man, Boo Radley. You know what the gossip was around town? Town gossip said that when he was younger in an unprovoked attack, he stabbed his father in the leg with a pair of scissors. So his father had to put him in an asylum. He was locked in the cellar of the courthouse until he became ill. Then his father took him home. Reportedly mad, the father kept him in the cellar locked during the day and only allowed him out at night. Can I tell you who I think the most tragic, lonely figure is in film? It's this guy. Oh, did you listen to some here in the front? The compassion for Gollum, also known as Smeagol. Once a hobbit, he discovered a ring, you know the ring, led him to a tragic existence in subterranean solitude. And when we're introduced to him in The Hobbit, he has lived for 400 years on raw fish. Garlock. His life, that's not true, that's not true. His life revolved around keeping the ring safe, his precious. It took a toll on him so that physically he became grotesque and disfigured. Now, each of those characters I showed you are tragic ones because they are lonely people. Devoid of community, their lives are lived in very small, cramped arenas. Now, I want you to think of the contrast of those characters with those that are blessed and enjoy life. You know who comes to my mind immediately? And there may be a little bit of a generation gap with this character. I don't know if you're gonna know this one. You know him? Who is that? George Bailey. George Bailey, I love this movie. It's sentimental, it's corny. But I love it, and every December, my wife and I invite people over, and we sit, and during the movie, as tears fill my eye, I reach over and take her hand, and look into her eyes, and she says, let go of my hand. <laughs> it's just a beautiful moment. I mean, I love that film, because George becomes the toast of the town. I mean, the movie ends with everybody singing Old Lang Syne as they toast him and celebrate him. That's what's going on, and it's around the Christmas tree, and Clarence gets wings, and you know, you, you finish the movie and you feel good and right, and I go outside and I watch the snow fall, and I say, North Chile, I love you. <laughs> it's just awesome. You see, he's blessed. Why is he blessed? Because he's in community. He's not like Gollum. He's not like Wally. 
He's not like Dory. He's in community. And it leaves you all warm and fuzzy. And you pet the dog that's lying at your feet because you feel so good. What a contrast between George and Gollum. Two completely different lives. One lived among mildew and the other enveloped in a house full of people who just love and cherish him. So, which story do you want to jump into? I mean, really, which story do you want to step into right now at this time in your life? If you're saying to yourself, I want to be Gollum, there's something seriously wrong and there's a group of people right now staged outside to help you. Because if you're choosing that, I, I, I tell you, there's something wrong. Because I think we were made for George Bailey's life. We were made for community. And I say that because Scripture tells us that, God's Word. So God, at the very outset, looks at the first person who is all alone and says, Wow, this is not cool. Is this a guy from Minor? I'm sorry, I love Minor guys. He says, this isn't cool. This guy should not be alone. So he gives him Eve. Back to Wally. Eve. There's Abraham, who is promised descendants more numerous than the stars. Think of what Christmas morning would have been like for that family if they would have been able to celebrate Christmas morning. Moses is given a nation with whom to go on a very long hike. So throughout the Old Testament, if you look at it, it's clear God intended us to live in community. God wants us to be with other people who love and cherish and extend friendship. And judgment, on the other hand, in Scripture, is portrayed as solitary. So Cain has a tough with Abel, kills his brother, and what happens to Cain? He sent out, let me read to you what it says in Genesis, to be a restless wanderer on earth, all alone, haunted by an obsession. People who are ceremonially unclean, in Israel are sent off to be by themselves. No potlucks at the temple. Take Job. Good old Job. Have you ever read the story of Job? Afflicted by Satan. Ends up losing his oxen and donkeys, his sheep, his servants, his camels. Don't take the camels. And then to make things worse, he loses his sons and daughters. And then he's even more miserable because he's covered with sores from his feet to the top of his head. And he's, he ends up sitting in an ash heap, a burn pit, scraping his, his oozing sores with a piece of broken pottery. Yeah, invite him to Saturday Night Live. Throughout the Old Testament, blessed people are rich in community and people who are not blessed but are cursed are alone and isolated. It's true in the New Testament, too. There's no difference, really. Jesus, when he walked the earth, fostered community, first by calling together a group of 12 to live, eat, breathe, walk, teach with him. And then he invites lonely people all the time to join him. This Samaritan woman at the well who had to come at noon in the heat of the day to draw water so she could avoid the gossip and the pointing and the leering. Jesus welcomes her. He's always inviting people to join him, the poor, the marginalized, the ostracized. And if Jesus would have been walking during the Old Testament days on earth, he would have hunted down Cain to extend relationship with him. He would have invited the ceremonially unclean out to have coffee with him. He would have sat down on the ash heap with Job and said, hey, let me help you scrape those boils. Well, maybe he wouldn't have done that. You get the picture. Jesus was always engaging people in community. 
and he does it with other people around him. Do you know how the Bible ends? The Bible ends with this incredible restored earth that is portrayed as a city. Isn't that interesting? Not as a country estate, but as a city. People living in close proximity. Why? Because God's intent, he designed us to be around with other people and to love being with people and to be blessed by being with people, to be in relationship with other people. God's story is all about creating community. And that's why Jesus came. He came to break down walls that divide and separate. He wanted to tear down walls no matter who funded them. No barriers, no division, no longer, remember this, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, no longer Republican or Democrat, rich or poor, educated, uneducated, cool or uncool, fans of the bills or not fans of the bills, all divisions gone. Are the bills playing this year? I haven't heard yet. Why did Jesus break down barriers? because he wanted community. He knew that was the Father's plan. He knew that was God's vision. I love a passage in the Old Testament that's found, I love all the passages in the Old Testament, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to exclude any of them, except the genealogies, I really don't love them. But there's a prophet by the name of Zechariah who is given a vision of what Jerusalem is supposed to look like when it's restored, and there's hints that this is what really God wants the world to look like when it's restored. It's in Zechariah chapter 8. It's a great description. Listen to it. Here's how it goes. Old men and old women will come back to Jerusalem, sit on benches on the streets and spin tails, move around safely with their canes, a good city to grow old in, and boys and girls will fill the public parks, laughing and playing a good city to grow up in. I think that's a really cool image. Old and young, enjoying a day in the park. Kids playing hopscotch alongside old guys playing checkers, everybody interacting, telling stories, laughing and celebrating and savoring life. That's the world as God intended it. And here's what grieves me. Here's what grieves me. I think our world is moving away from that. And Roberts is called to be a place that pushes back in the other direction and fosters community. I don't know why you came to Roberts. But I'm hoping you came to Roberts at least in part because you came for community and you desire community, and you hunger for community, and you want community, and you're here to build friendships with as many people as you can. Before chapel started, I was talking with a new friend I have. My new friend, Lendy. Lendy, stand up. You switch seats on me. Lendy, do you guys know Lendy? Lendy, can you come up here? Yeah, come up here, Lendy. Yeah, come up here. Come on, Lindy, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lindy, do you trust me? She's not saying a word. She's saying, no, I don't trust you. Come up, come here, Lindy. Pop up here. Yeah. Yeah. Round of applause for Lindy. So I was talking to Lindy, and do you know this is Lindy's third week here at Roberts? Is that cool? Now, you need to know, she transferred here from MCC. Yeah. And she is a nursing major. So I said to Lindy, I said, Lindy, not Lindy. I called her that and she slapped me. <laughs> Lindy, Lindy. Am I exaggerating? A little bit, okay. So I said, Lindy, how have your first couple of weeks been? And how have the first couple of weeks been? Good. Okay. Yeah, that was, can we do that as a promo video for the college? <laughs> good, good, yeah, not bad, yeah. yeah. Um, and I said, have you made any friends here? And she said, 
She, she said, I already had friends who were here. So she came here knowing some people. And I said, well, what's the difference between going to MCC and going to Roberts? Is it okay if I tell them what you said? I mean, if you want to tell them, you can. No, okay. Are you having fun today? Yeah. Like, is this the best moment for you right now? Yeah, okay. Okay. So when I asked her what the difference was, she said, in MCC, the buildings are all connected and there's a lot more people around you all the time. It's a little more crowded, right? Is that true? Okay. And, but I said, well, well how's it been at Robertson? And she said, it's been welcoming. Is that cool? So Lendy says, Roberts has been welcome. You may go back to your seat. Thank you, Lendy. Round of applause, round of applause. Now, I met someone else while I was around chapel before it started. Yeah, I met Makita. Where'd she go? Makita, you moved on me, you dirty, rotten scoundrel. Am I allowed to call students that? Makita, come out here. Yeah, this is Makita. Come on up, Makita. Come on. We don't have much time, Makita, so move it. Okay. So this is Makita. Is, is that a cool name? Her name's Makita because her dad's name is Mark, and he wanted her to bear his name, so it's Makita. I've never known anyone named Makita. How are you doing? Yeah. Now, now, how long have you been at Roberts? Uh, this is my second year. Yeah, second year. So this is a this is she knows the ropes, right? Yeah. This is really cool. You know what her major is? Take a guess. No, it's not nursing. Come on. Why? Why would people come here for nursing? Um, it's math. It's math. It's math. Yeah. And she wants to be a school teacher. Isn't that cool? So now I didn't get to talk to you about this. But have you found Roberts to be a welcoming place? Yeah, very welcoming. Wait, did you just say very welcoming and that you love it here? Yeah. Have you made friends? Yeah. Uh, like, name one. Uh, Stephanie. Stephanie, <laughs> Stephanie, stand up. So this is Stephanie, who's from Webster. You can go back to your seat, thank you. Now, now Stephanie, is from Webster, which I always think is arrogant. Because do you know what their town motto is? Where life is worth living. Like all the rest of you, just give it up. Just give it up. Yeah. Stephanie, now if you're friends, why aren't you sitting together? You had a fight. Okay, I want to talk with you and pray with you after this, okay? Yeah. So, I, this is the best time of your life to build community. You will never be in a place surrounded by so many wonderful people that are so accessible as you will at Roberts Wesleyan College. God created you not to be Dory. God created you not to be Gollum. God created you to live life in rich community. And our culture is moving away. There's a very popular book called Bowling Alone that was written. A lot of study. They interviewed more than a half a million people and they found out in America people are less likely to gather in community. They're less likely to belong to volunteer associations. They're less likely to play games together with family and friends. They're less likely to engage in social activities than previous generations were becoming isolated. There's an MIT professor by the name of Sherry Turkle who wrote a book called Alone Together. And her premise is, is technology has created an artificial and fake intimacy. And we think we're in relationship because we text someone. And she said, we're losing it. We're alone together. So what do I want you to do? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to build community here, because that's what God intended, to build community. How do you do that, okay? When you go to Garlock and you see someone sitting by themselves, what do you do? I don't know. Okay, wait, let me try this again, okay. So when you go to Garlock and you see someone sitting all alone, what do you do? Sit next to them. You sit next to them, yes! 
Is that so hard to do? Have you ever died from sitting next to someone you didn't know? Not yet. That was the husband of our president. Not yet. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. President Porterfield, I want to see you and your husband after the service in my office. When you walk around campus, you know what I want you to do? Say, as you pass someone. Hi. Oh, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. That was good. Hi. Can you, I, I've tried this the last, I've, I've been in this position two weeks, and I have walked by, I've kept, kept track. Three quarters of the people I walk by and say hi to don't even look at me or respond. <laughs> so change it. Start building relationships. Be in community. Why God created you not to be Dory. You're not to be Gollum. How's chapel going? Good. Okay. Good. What's your name? Danielle. Danielle. Okay. What year are you? Freshman. Oh. <laughs> Applaud that Danielle chose to come to Robert Wesley College. <laughs> okay, you've got your marching orders. You know what you're doing today? You see someone, you're going to say? Hi. You walk into the dining hall, someone's alone, you say? Sit next to them. No, you don't say sit next to them. You sit next to them and say hi. Are we getting it? The message? Do you know what you're supposed to do today? Then what are you doing still here? Go! Get out of here. Change the campus. Live in community.